I should be back and I can participate, but my audio has some background noise. Okay, um, I'll just kick us off real quick then. So everyone, please go ahead and add yourself in. And we'll just go down the name or uh, the list of names in attendance and just do some quick updates. Sarah, since you just uh, talked, do you want to go ahead and do so again? Yes. So um, I've been traveling, so no real updates from me. Um, I'm Sarah Allen, normally facilitating this meeting. Thank you. I'm the, one of the co-chairs of the working group. And um, thanks, Justin, for helping out. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm Justin Capos. Uh, I uh, I guess something moderately exciting is that our Uptane, which is the automotive version of Tough Project, is we've now finalized all the legal parts and we're now part of the Linux Foundation's joint development project. Um, and we also did some other things with officially, officially, officially having the IEEE ISTO standard for the current version of what it is we've done out. So yeah, um, that's that's been one of the major things I've done. All right. Uh, why don't we have... Sorry, uh, Brent? Which, sorry just one question. Uh, which bit, which part of the Linux Foundation is Uptane in? Uh, so there's something called the Joint Development Foundation that was recently, as maybe a month or so ago, um, was a separate effort, but kind of was absorbed into the Linux Foundation in some way. Uh, there was, it, I think maybe the, the question that isn't being asked here is why isn't it part of AGL? Um, but there's uh, AGL is not a home for specs, and Uptane is a is a spec with a reference implementation that's already in AGL called Actualizer. So as a result, um, the JDF was a very natural, perfect home for us, and has a path to like ISO standardization and other things. I think that Tough and other projects like this uh, will retain their current homes, but may also benefit from uh, some resources that the JDF provides, like ISO standardization in the future and I'm happy to talk more about that if that become if that's of interest to anyone else uh, but maybe um, we can either do that after the check-in or or take it offline either one okay uh, great so Brandon hi um, Brandon um, from IBM so uh, I've been working on the emission encryption stuff because of the recent acquisition of Red Hat, and now we are moving to OpenShift, so we're moving a lot of the SAC to the Red Hat related technologies. Um, so we have implementations of the encrypted container images as well in the Red Hat SAC, and then we are going to collaborate with them to, to kind of push it upstream as well. So if all goes well, um, hopefully we'll see this in both ContainerD and uh, Red Hat stack within the next couple of months. Yeah. Um, awesome. On top of that, so uh, the key code folks for the security assessment said that they'll be back um, around August. So probably next week or so, I'll give them a ping, see whether they can start working on the, um, the outline. Great, great. Um, yeah, and we'll need to talk uh, more after the check-ins about where we're at with the assessments and what to do and how to push things a little further along. Um, Craig? I am Craig Ingram. I'm uh, with Heroku. I'm part of the Kubernetes Security Audit Working Group, uh, which has been wrapping up and is almost ready for release. And I'm excited that we have some folks here today from the Trail of Bits team that, that did the actual work uh, to give an update on that as well. Great, great. Yeah, and we'll hear from Dan in just a moment. But first, uh, Justin Cormack. Um, I haven't got much to report this week, so. Um... Okay. Um... Oh, wait, Ray. Hi, my name is Ray. Um, I'm kind of new to the group. I joined last last week. It's my uh, second meeting. So I'm just here just to check it out. And I'm kind of new to the cloud native space. I work for a cloud native um, consulting company. And so, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Dan, good to see you here. Yeah. Hey. Um, so I'm Dan Guido from Trail of Bits. I brought Stefan Edwards along with me. Uh, we just wanted to drop in, introduce ourselves, uh, share a little bit about what happened during the Kubernetes security review, and uh, offer to help with other projects and problems that you're trying to solve. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Mark Underwood. Hey, 
I'm at uh, Synchrony representing myself and also the NIST Big Data Working Group. So much exciting stuff that I'm not going to say anything. All right. Well, that opens us up for Gareth to say something exciting. Uh, I'm not sure about exciting, but I can always be guaranteed to say something. Uh, probably, well, so I guess related to this, um, so people might not have come across there is a, there is a new uh, SIG in the process of a applying for a charter, um, uh, another CNCF SIG, specifically around application delivery. Um, the intention is somewhere to ha like house, um, I guess, like guides, papers, uh, like that cross lots of different projects. Um, there hasn't been, so like the, there's, there's a draft charter going out to the TOC today, tomorrow, this week. Um, I think it's interesting. There hasn't been a lot of conversation there about security yet. Uh, it's very new anyway. But I think there's an interesting relationship between this group and that one in that if there are guidance, white paper type aspects going out about uh, how to do cloud native applications, if like them having a security review component would be, like, would be great versus them not having them and people head desking because they've got the guidance in them is uh, leading down people down people down an insecure path um like I, I don't think that's a that's basically a problem with we're, we're well ahead of uh and i or i hope we are by me bringing it up today awesome yes uh thank you christian so i'm finally making some progress on on issue 165 the platform implementer persona I tried to chase down somebody here at Google that apparently wrote uh, uh, use cases for that persona, but those use cases uh, weren't quite usable. So um, yeah, I'm making some progress on that and, and I have uh, another lead here at Google that I want to query uh, some of our own corporate people that basically try to make Google's cloud platform work for our corporate needs. So that is a pretty similar role. So I'm hopefully making progress on that till next week. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael. Yep, um, working on release planning for Falco um, to hopefully have a release uh, around the time of October, November timeframe. Uh, and then also have been uh, working on the SIG Security Day, which we have a, which is now called the Cloud Native Security Day at KubeCon. We have a call to discuss that uh, after this meeting. Great. Yeah, I think that's going to be a terrific event. Um, I'm, you know, definitely been watching that closely and looking to see how that all turns out. Um, and I think we have also Michael Haus Hausenblas. The other Michael, exactly. Hi, my name is Michael Hausenblas. I'm a developer advocate in the container service team at AWS looking after container security. And I still owe a bunch of work uh, around the microsite. Uh, launches keep me busy, so I... Uh, I will do that, definitely, very soon. OK, great. And did we miss anyone? Uh, yes, I'm Martin. Uh, I am from VMware uh, in their open source team. And it's my second time here. And yeah, I will see. I'm, I hope that I will be able to help you guys in the future with something. And yeah. Oh, we've got Stefan here. I don't think he said anything, but I yeah, I, I was just about the intro. My name is Stefan Edwards. Uh, I worked with Craig on the uh, on the Kubernetes working group for actually auditing both the technical side as well as the the threat side. And then obviously, I work with Dan at Trail of Bits, where I am a principal consultant. I do a lot of our threat modeling, uh, some VC so and and other things uh, here. So uh, I I'll be giving some talk today. I have some slides presented, nothing super heavyweight, uh, but I just wanted to talk about what we did for threat modeling uh, and, and how we ran it and what we were looking at so that you all can have some insight into where that report went and what you'll be seeing soon, so. Great, um, that sounds terrific. So now is the point when I think uh, Sarah, who knows best the check-in from partners, SIGs and working groups, um, is going to step in and take over. Otherwise, I'm going to show my ignorance about <laughs> what's going on. 
Thank you, Justin, for now the, uh, the background noise has gone into another room, so I'm back. Um, so um, I just captured a couple of things um, for the agenda. Um, I'm not sure, I'm actually gonna um, skip or move to the end the, I mean, it does say as needed. Um, since we do have the folks from Trail of Bits here, um, I'd like to um, invite you to um, be on deck first. So we have um, plenty of time for that. And because I know people, it's come up in conversation um, uh, over as you've been working on it. And I think everybody's curious about it. So if you, you know, like if there's stuff that you are prepared to share today, I think that'd be great. If there's, um, if that's something that you want to queue up for another time, that's cool too. Now we're ready. Uh, thanks for giving us the floor first. Stefan put together like five short slides that just help visualize what happens. And um, I'll let him kind of prep his desktop for a recorded screen. <laughs> cool. I'll do you one better, Dan. I will share only the slides that I intended to. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I really wanted to walk through um, this. We don't need to do an introduction to us since we, we did the, the round table. But I wanted to walk through um, how we ran the threat model because I think uh, threat modeling open source software, especially of the size of Kubernetes uh, and then other similar components can be very difficult. Um, we had people from companies that are technically competitors working with us and trying to represent everyone's uh, understanding of, of Kubernetes and everyone's different uh, viewpoints and from component teams, from competitors, those sorts of things was an interesting challenge here. Uh, just one thing I, I want to note beforehand, technically some of this information that we are discussing hasn't been released publicly yet. Uh, Craig and I are working to, to get this all ramped down, uh, but some folks on this call have already seen the report. I just wanted to scroll through some sections, uh, but there technically could be things in here that are unpatched vulnerabilities to Kubernetes uh, at a design level. So I just ask that you please don't share this uh, too widely. Obviously, this is a recorded call. There's people from the community on here. Uh, so just, just don't uh, crow any of the things that you've seen here, but there will be some vulnerabilities that are uh, not public currently at this time. Loose um, tweet sync fleets. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so methodology was, was very interesting. Uh, I think as most people have seen with Kubernetes, it's a very networked, very, uh, you know, very intricate system. There are many different state machines. There are many different uh, things such as there are multiple uh, public key infrastructures within Kubernetes itself. So having a data flow for the restricted set of of components that we were interested in uh, was fairly interesting. I'll talk about what components we had when I switch over to the report itself, uh, but there was a, actually having something that is a documented from, from Kubernetes, from the, the Linux Foundation's viewpoint as a more canonical uh, data flow was the first step here. So during the technical assessment and talking with Craig and other folks on the team, we came up with what was a rough data flow model uh, for this. I actually use PyTM, if people are familiar with that. It is a Pythonic threat modeling framework uh, to get the initial pass out so that we could iterate programmatically on that instead of having to redraw slides and redraw uh, things there. Uh, so from there, we went to go on and understand the connections between components at a logical level, uh, understanding trust zones, the threat actors therein, and what concern points we had between those. Uh, so for example, we wanted to understand what a external user meant, what an internal user meant, what a malicious internal administrator meant, and what components and what items they could touch within Kubernetes both from a technical component side, as well as a trust zone side. Uh, so we undertook that analysis. I will show you some of that shortly. Uh, and then we situated the, each control family uh, within the, the uh, larger Kubernetes system itself. And when I say control families, I mean this in sort of a like uh, NIST 
800 series style of control? Like, are we talking about audit family? Are we talking about uh, multi-tenancy? Those sorts of things. So going through, and I will show you how I address this, uh, going through each of the components and understanding what controls they implemented, how strong they were implemented, what they were attempting to protect against, and where those were implemented. Uh, we, we then went through and situated those as best as possible. To pregame for all of the meetings that we held with SIGs, um, Craig sat in on some of these meetings, uh, Jay Beal, one of our counterparts on, on the uh, working group, Aaron uh, from Google, we all sat in on meetings with the SIGs and I went through and asked people from you know, SIG API machinery, how do you handle multi-tenancy? How do you handle uh, you know, various other things like authentication, authorization? What do you do for this? What control failures do we see? And I documented that entire process. We captured the output of those meetings in what are called rapid risk assessment documents. I specifically designed some rapid risk assessment documents for this assessment. Um, I'll show you one in just a few moments. Uh, and then I collected the output from those, all of the findings, all of the really great notes, all of the how does this service work sort of things, and I threw them into a threat model, um, added, added a bunch of findings, added a bunch of, uh, of risks and concerns that we had, and then worked with Craig and other folks to actually uh, contextualize those risks and come up with a, an overarching uh, design critique, I, I guess you could say, of where we can go, what we can do better. And some of these things have already been fixed uh, in more recent releases of, of Kubernetes. Uh, but it was a very interesting process because there are so many components. So in terms of control families here, uh, the audit working group asked us to focus on roughly six control families. Now, this doesn't mean that we weren't interested in something, say, logging, right? There were several times where we talked about logging, we talked about non-repudiation, we talked about other control families, but the main focus of our assessment was these six control families. We're interested in authorization, authentication, cryptography, etc. So for each of the SIGs, I came up with a series of questions, I worked with Craig and others to review those, and then we sent those out to members of the open source community and polled them for answers. So if you go back through the, the archives of some of the, the SIGs, you'll actually see me, Craig, and other folks reaching out to many, many people of the open source community and literally asking them for, uh, for time to just sit on a meeting and discuss some of these things or to look over the, the, uh, the questions that I was asking and provide any feedback. So we, we received some from, from the community directly itself. Uh, folks had some corrections, they had some comments and things like that. And then we also went to some of our constituent organizations uh, and asked members of the community who worked at those companies uh, to, to sit in on meetings with us and to actually review each of these control families. Now, we did rapid risk assessments. If, if you're not familiar with this, this is a process that Mozilla uh, actually came up with. Rapid risk assessments are a very quick way of understanding your CIA triad for a threat model. So if you want to, if you have a data flow and you want to understand what the impact of a certain set of risks are and come up with recommendations quickly, uh, Mozilla has worked on this process. Now, it's, it's interesting uh, when you're doing this for normal threat modeling, but it's not necessarily the most useful for what we wanted to do. We were doing control focused, we were interested in a specific set of components. Uh, so I actually modified this process and I can switch to that right now. Uh, one second whilst I find it. Uh, hang on one second. Chrome does not want to show. Uh, ah, here we go. Perfect. Uh, so we actually came up with these RRA documents. Uh, if you look for Mozilla Rapid Risk Assessment, you will see their document. They have a, a very nice Google Doc that you can use. Uh, but it was not as useful for us within the working group. We had, this, we had to work with many people from the community. We, had to, uh, we, we coordinated many of our activities via Git and GitHub. Uh, so we wanted a very simple markdown document. So 
basically for each one of the RRAs uh, and each one of the, the SIGs, we went through and asked them the normal threat modeling questions that you would ask, such as, how does the service work? What sort of data does this operate on? What, like, why do I care as an attacker and as a threat modeler uh, as to this component? Like, what am I looking for in this thing? And then each one of those answers I, I collected. Um, so for, as everyone knows, for example, there are sub components that exist within the same host, but are technically within different trust boundaries. So a kubelet, uh, it would be on a worker node but then there are also maybe pods or other things on that worker node that, that transit trust boundaries there. So we wanted to capture the answers for each one of these, these situations and then go through and ask about each and every location, what data is stored, uh, where does it store it, what's the sensitivity of that data, et cetera, as you would normally do. And then I captured meeting notes, any findings that were there, uh, within the system itself, There's, they're quite extensive. Uh, Jonathan has actually seen some of this already, and Craig obviously has lived through this. Um, but there, there's quite a number of things that we asked, captured, and went through uh, with the teams that we will be making public um, relatively shortly as we go through this. Uh, and the reason why I'm showing you these things is you may be able to build off of the RRA notes that we have. You may be able to build off the, the data flow diagrams and other things that we already created uh, to help speed up your uh, threat modeling processes and whatnot. So a number of notes were collected. Uh, we went through and analyzed all of the control families. Uh, we did talk through some threat scenarios. We did talk through findings, et cetera. Um, but all in all, we captured a large number of notes across the, the entirety of the system. Uh, if I go back here, uh, you can see that we actually had a rapid risk assessment document for each, uh, for each item within the system. So we were only focused on a certain number of components within Kubernetes, not the entire system itself, uh, but we did capture an RA for that. Now, does anyone have questions before I actually go on to the, the report itself? Well, I have just a question about what do you mean by the entire system versus the components? Sure. So Kubernetes actually has quite a few, uh, quite a few components that we did not look at itself. So for example, um, when Kubernetes talks about networking, there are a number of components within the system that handle networking. So for, uh, you'd see something like Kube proxy and kubelet, and other items actually interact with the Linux routing table or other commands at the network level. So we would focus on kube proxy and kubelet, but say we wouldn't necessarily look into the various CNIs that are out there, the actual container network interfaces that were there. So Calico was not in scope, Flannel was not in scope, those sorts of things were not there. Uh, so any vulnerabilities or any design issues that we've seen with those were not in scope for our assessment. Does that make sense? Well, I guess the question is, um, in a norm, like, I know there are a lot of components that are optional, right, that, that you don't need, but like, with this assessment, I would, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, what, do you, what, do, what, do, what are we supposed to take away from it? Does it mean that I could use Kubernetes with only these components and my own code, and then I would know something about this, then this audit would be meaningful, or this is a baseline which by itself doesn't really tell you anything about the system? So it tells you about the most critical components within the system. Uh, so we were interested in those components that Kubernetes itself controls. Uh, so like cube scheduler, is there, is there an issue there? Is there an issue with any of the controller managers? But where we did not dive into is say something such as Docker. So we were interested in how Kubernetes interacts with Docker or how Kubernetes interacts with, with Calico and Flannel for networking, but we were not reviewing Docker and we were not reviewing Calico and Flannel uh, themselves. So it, in, in order to answer your question, it's really more that we had a baseline pulse of design concerns within Kubernetes itself, but there are other wider concerns based on your choices there. 
So there may be issues that we've seen with calico that don't exist in flannel and vice versa that you still have to, if you're using these components in your organization, you still have to understand risks that are there on top of Kubernetes risks themselves. Does that distinction make sense? Yes. Yeah, so is this the complete set of components that are like in the Kubernetes org? I just, you know, like I'm just, I'm just, uh, and, and we can move on. I'm just trying to get to that scope and, and I want to let other people ask questions. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, no, these are not the complete set of, of uh, components within the, the Kubernetes organization. These are the, the most critical ones that we wanted to get some lens upon in order to understand technical concerns as well as uh, design concerns within these components themselves. Okay. So this is really more like a foundation for a few, for a company doing their own audit. Absolutely. It's a, a foundation for Kubernetes and the CNCF to review some design decisions that they've made within Kubernetes. Uh, and then it's also absolutely a, a, a company could go in and look at these sorts of things and see these sorts of design concerns and then design around them. Um, one of the mandates that we had from the audit team was to not use previously existent uh, vulnerabilities. So like we weren't dinging them for things that were uh, known issues within Kubernetes itself. Yeah, I do want to jump in for a second too. Um, a lot, a lot of the mandate was also to provide kind of a, a, a foundational um, set of information that we could use to drive further security review inside Kubernetes. Since even in the vast amount of time that we had on like a subjective basis compared to the size of the rest of our projects, um, the level of complexity, number of components, and just sheer amount of code involved in Kubernetes is you're not going to get to the whole thing in that time frame. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we're lifting all boats in the community and helping them understand uh, where else they should search next and what a good prioritized um, outcome oriented uh, list of tasks to work on would be. Um, and this threat model document that Stefan's got up now represents about one third of the total deliverables that we made for this project. I think the threat model is particularly interesting to this SIG. Um, but we also have a list of specific security issues that we found, about uh, 30 or 40 of them, as well as a white paper document that summarizes a lot of what we learned doing this project that we hope other, people's could, uh, other people could use to kind of repeat and then advance upon um, uh, our, our own work. So this, this is uh, one of many outcomes. Uh, and I have a quick question. Uh, so have you, I'm curious, uh, have you looked into Cube Controller Manager? Because I would assume that's one of the main components uh, in Kubernetes, right? Uh, yes. So we did KCM and CCM. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, and, and so our interest in KCM and CCM was, was uh, and we actually can, I can dive into that. Um, our interest in, in KCM and CCM uh, was intriguing because they're very focused components, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but the interesting thing about KCM and CCM is they actually violate uh, the principle of least authority in some ways. Uh, <laughs> so there are components within KCM and CCM that are more privileged than others. And the only thing that's really stopping a component from calling another subcomponent is uh, trust currently. So uh, there was very interesting discussions that we had, and this is the sort of thing that I mentioned, please don't like tweet about this just, just yet. Uh, but there are very interesting discussions going on uh, within the SIGs as to how to design around some of the concerns that we came up with uh, during our, our discussions. To be honest, uh, the, as much as I'm very happy with the work that I did on the threat model and there's a bunch of cool tables and I, I did all sorts of really neat stuff, I think the most interesting output from this was actually having folks from the community sit down on a call similar to this one and talk about, well, what does KCM and CCM do for authorization? And that was extremely interesting because different folks had different perspectives on the various components and getting them to talk about it in one single space was extremely enlightening. Sure, definitely. So just flipping back to where we were, um, as, we're as we're all aware, Kubernetes is, is quite, <laughs> quite, 
quite large in the number of components. So I had to situate components themselves, uh, the ones that we were tasked with reviewing within planes, and then uh, situate those planes within trust zones. So if you've done threat models before, you've seen trust zones, like there's a database layer, uh, system administrators may have access to that. What components sit within those? What, uh, you know, what planes are they in? Those sorts of things. So those sorts of analyses uh, are, are here. And going forward, you may want to lift uh, some of these trust zones because they've been vetted by the community. They've been vetted by uh, the working group on the, the Kubernetes side. There may be some interesting things that you can build off of uh, from these trust zones as well in your, in your threat model as well. Uh, and then there's obviously a connection analysis. This was actually fairly interesting. Uh, we did find a number of locations that had uh, weak connections. So they may use HTTP by default. They may have the option of using uh, authenticated TLS connections, but do not, those sorts of things. And then sort of sussing out all of those connection types and, and sussing out all of, the, uh, all of the various zones and how an attacker can transit those zones was extremely fascinating uh, whilst talking with the, the various SIGs themselves. And then uh, we have threat actors, obviously. Um, this then drove uh, all of our findings. So if you go through the findings once this is released, uh, when I talk about who can undertake this, I use just these users themselves. There are no other users used throughout. So that you have a standard set of, of folks that you're actually attacking a system. Um, and then I wanted to talk about, obviously, where they come from and where do they, they uh, want to attack throughout the system. Uh, and then I talk through the controls, uh, which ones we focused on, which other ones we had, and then did an actual analysis of these. So if you go through each one of the components, you'll see that they, it has a control family. It has a, a subjective strength category that talks about is this satisfactory? What is satisfactory means is defined up above and then gives you a description of each area there. So there's, there's quite a bit of data um, in, in the threat model that you may want to, to look for either in your own individual threat, uh, threat modeling activities within your organizations or as you carry out like a, a, a CNCF threat model here. And obviously we would be help, happy to answer any questions on that. Um, and then uh, we actually get into the individual component level findings. Uh, what I actually did was broke down findings by component. Uh, so rather than just have a giant list of components, uh, a giant list of findings, I should say, each finding is situated within the, within the component section that is there. Uh, and then there's a general architectural summary of, uh, of the component and of the findings that we have there. So there's, there's quite a bit of data in here. I think there's 56 pages currently. There's a few other changes that we've made. So roughly 60 pages worth of information here um, and capture. The other thing that uh, we will be doing is once, once we've released this report, we will uh, almost certainly release the, uh, the raw data. So all, all the RAs, all the PI threat model files, those sorts of things will also be released. Uh, so you can build off of those either for, for your threat models internally or for the, the CNCF uh, threat modeling activities that you may be undertaking yourselves. So that was a lot of information <laughs> for everyone. But does anyone have questions on what the, what the output was? Or is there anything that Dan and I can answer about how we ran these sorts of things or anything we can do to accelerate your own reviews? Um, yeah, I'd like to to ask a question and make a mention. So first of all, when we do reviews of our own in, in the security, uh, uh, in, in the SIG, they're open for anyone to participate. We'd love to have, um, you know, folks from your group go and take a look at this. After we do about uh, three or four more of these, then we're gonna take a step back and try to look at how we change our process. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of your invaluable experience with doing this will be um, well and valuable in helping us adjust that process. Um, and then with that comment, I, I also it, 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 I also wanted to ask a question, a more focused question. Sure. Which is, um, so when doing security assessments for like Spiffy and Spire uh, and the projects like that, 
Um, similarly, we had lots of components that interacted with each other in interesting ways. And one thing that came out of that process is we also had to look quite a bit at an attacker that got access to one, uh, you know, like one um, component could often then use that to fairly easily take access, uh, like take control or gain access to other components in the system. And I'm, I'm wondering if the way in which you did things with Kubernetes uh, modeled that uh, in a straightforward way, whether that was difficult to do, whether that was out of scope or, or what your thoughts are. So uh, without getting too much in into uh, the technical side of it, we actually have a finding where a internal attacker, um, let me pull up that table, uh, but there is, there is a, a, a finding wherein a, a, an internal attacker is actually able to parlay their access, um, it is actually able to parlay that access to wider cluster access. So we have a technical finding for that sort of thing. Um, in terms of what we were looking for, when, when discussing the authorization and authentication components, I was always really uh, interested in hearing the SIG's thoughts on who should be accessing this and what they should be doing. So for example, when talking about uh, you know, the API server, right? This is the real heart besides Kubelet of the, of the Kubernetes system. So when talking about it, there, there could be a large number of people who have to interact with this. There could be developers that have to have access to this. There could be uh, administrators that need to have access to this. So when we're trying to understand who can do what to this thing, there's the, the coercion aspect, there's the, the malicious aspect, those sorts of things. So yes, absolutely, we did, we did talk about who can do what from where, uh, but we also had the technical side behind us because there is a whole other report with about 40 findings in it. Uh, we were able to leverage the two. So when we had, when we had technical findings uh, that became larger design issues, uh, we, we made them into architectural findings. And then when, as we saw things on the threat model, that, that looked a little interesting, that looked maybe like they could be a technical vulnerability as well. Uh, we fed that process there. If you're familiar with like NIST 800-115, NIST 800-37, those sorts of things, we really followed those sorts of like um, OODA loops. Like we see something uh, in the threat model, we see something in the technical side, we, we kick that back up as a discovery item and then feed it into the other process. So everything was feeding everything else so that we could look at who can, who can uh, parlay their access. And then we also looked to see if there were technical or design issues from each of the other two assessments. So very long-winded way of saying yes. <laughs> we, did, we did look at how an attacker can move laterally within the system, uh, both from a design level as well as from a, from a uh, technical level itself. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was great, thank you. Of course. Uh, and I think Sarah wanted uh, you or someone else to post in the chat the NIST references. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dan has heard me and Craig has heard me uh, do this. I will, uh, I will very frequently sit on phone calls with clients because of my government background and say things like, oh, you do NIST 812, which leads to NIST 830, 37, uh, 60, 61, 115, 53, 171, et cetera. Um, but yes, I can, I can certainly post all of those to, to folks. Yeah. That's not a problem. And we've had some people from government, from the U.S. government in this group, and um, there are other governments in the world. And I used to work for the U.S. government, too. So mm -hmm. it's always intriguing to um, sort of cross-fertilize the industry norms with the government norms and, you know, and, and share internationally, because I think we can all learn from the kind of different types of documentation, especially as more of cloud gets into the highly regulated space, um, all that stuff becomes pretty applicable to the industry. Absolutely. There's actually a great paper from the uh, Swedish Police Authority Academy. Um, I, I can find that reference. We, we reference it in, in this document. Uh, but they actually talk about how they used Kubernetes in a uh, highly policy-driven, highly uh, regulated environment and what the implications to doing that were. 
That's a super fascinating paper, but I will get that reference for everyone. Are there any other questions or, or comments that I can address for folks on the call? Thank you very much for having Dan and I. I do think we will uh, continue on with this. I think it's very interesting, uh, especially for me, um, because I, I worked with Craig on these sorts of things from the, the uh, Kubernetes side. Um, I think we'd be happy to continue on working on these sorts of things. I will get you the, the references that I made during this talk. Um, but if there's anything else, uh, please feel free to reach out to Dan and I via email. Uh, we'd be happy to, to pick it up. We're also on the Kubernetes um, Slack if you're there. Uh, so you can reach out to us and say, hello, I will include our handles in a, an email after this with the references. And then uh, we will also be joining the CNCF Slack as well. But uh, if, no, if no one else has any other questions, uh, I'd be happy to turn it back to the, uh, to the moderators. Yeah, I'll just say for Justin that we're happy to take a look at the process that you're using. Um, Absolutely. There are some folks that I could throw your way. Great. Yeah, um, we have the Intoto assessment already up, and we have a an assessment for OPA, OPA, um, that is uh, basically we're just kind of waiting for a tiny bit of discussion with that community, which has been a little off and on, and uh, then we're ready to push that one over the finish line. So. You, um, I think reopening the Intoto one maybe isn't the right thing to do, but helping us, uh, you know, if there's minor changes to what we've done with OPA, that would be great, or more substantial little tweaks to things for upcoming uh, assessments we're doing would be very, very welcome. Yeah, I think that, that'd be fabulous. And just, I don't know if we mentioned it, but um, our plan is to do five of them and then really do a retrospective on the process. So having, you know, kind of, like look at what we've done and also forward looking and we have an issue you can chime in on or you know email or whatever is good for you we just really welcome your participation thanks yeah we'd be happy to participate cool so we'll be seeing each other again <laughs> excellent any are there any other well last chance for chiming in on questions super so you should see these all go out sometime soon. I guess Craig will know better than, than we do, but um, all the documentation should be out. I, I, I think we were originally aiming for before Black Hat, but I have no idea what the time looks like. Yeah, I think everybody would be eager to read whenever you're ready. Um, so Craig, if, you, um, if you're on the six security Slack or you know, if you email me or, you know, actually email is terrible, but um, I think that uh, it'd be great if um, somebody dropped that in the Slack when it's ready. Yeah, I think the, the plan is still sometime next week, last I heard. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'm on the Slack, so I'll, I'll drop it in there as well. And I, I think the CNCF is going to have blog posts and stuff for that, too. So. Thanks, Craig. All right. I think there was a question or comment, um, Justin Capos, on the upcoming assessments and prioritization that you mentioned and, it'd be, and other people, I think, are interested. Or maybe Brandon mentioned it. I think... I think we both said something quick. Um, I think I said most of what I wanted to say. Maybe Brandon can step, can step in. Well, is this about the key cloak? Uh, I think it was it just basically like if you could give a little update, since I didn't write down exactly, but um, if you could give a little update on what it, I think Justin just talked about OPA, but of the next ones that are coming up, um, what are the, what is coming up and, um, you know, kind of like status and, on things. Yeah. So, um, I think Robert put together a pretty nice, um, table as well on that. Uh, let me just bring it up. Yeah. If you could screen share it, that'd be great. Yeah. I, I just, just saw that before the meeting. Thank you, Robert. Uh, what the, fine. Okay. Got it. All right. So this is uh, difficult to read. I don't know how to make this nicer. Oh, there we go. 
um, yeah, so so Robert put together this thing um, which shows kind of like the next uh, reviews coming up, people who signed up basically uh, that commented on the issue. So um, for Key Cloak, we, we have quite a lot of volunteers already. So it seems like we have a group of people. We'll be contacting the, um, the folks again next week. Um, they were all on vacation our way um, this past month. Um, um, on Kiko, though, I think we need one more of our original team for continuity. So it needs to, we need to have me or Justin Cormack or Justin Capos. Isn't, isn't Lom JJB, is that Brandon? It's Brandon. Yeah, that's I thought me. we said we were going to try to have two Oh, ones. yeah, that's right. We're going to have a lead who's done it before and then some, you know, then have another person who is, if we, you know, uh, maybe yeah. something, something. I just want to mention that. Um, I think having one of us look over it would be good. I don't, uh, I don't, like, I would be happy to be somewhat involved with that. Uh, but um, I'm, yeah, I, I think I think we'll it, we shouldn't put too fine a point on it to make it. Um, I, I I do think that there's a slight conflict of interest given that Brandon works for IBM and it's an IBM project now. Well, <laughs> so I, I I I think that that might be viewed as a conflict. It's not. It might be viewed as a conflict of interest. Ah, uh, so I, I hear a volunteer to lead. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so then in that case, uh, I think both Hasha and I wouldn't be able to participate in this then. I think it's um, fine to participate. I just think, I would. Just, I just think as a lead, it's a little bit. So Justin Cormack, since you were part of our original assessments, will you take the lead on Key Cloak? Yeah, I can do that. And then Brandon, do you want to move to one of the others? Yeah, um, do we decide which ones that we want to look at next? Is, um, are we having conversation with the TOC on this as well? So we are, um, the process for hearing from the TOC on their prioritization is ongoing. And so we are just moving forward with our best guess. So, um, so Justin Kaplis, do you want to chime in on what you would pick next or? Because it basically we're going, we're balancing readiness with the things that are useful for our process. It looks I like think, Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I think we don't have to look too far ahead since we're, I, I mean, we don't want to do these too, too much in parallel anyway. Um, but Key Cloak seems ready. Um, we should get someone on the TOC to give us a nod and say yes, just so that later on when we get a message from oh, I don't know, some random person, I'll call him Mr. Q, about why we picked that, then um, we can say, well, Liz told us or Michelle told us or whoever told us to do this. All right, I'll, I'll just ping Liz um, or Joe and make sure that that's cool. Yeah. Um, and and then, so maybe maybe Brandon, you could just be responsible for figuring out who's ready after Key Cloak. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then, we, you know. We know that Falco already. Oh, are they? Written on this call, I think. Oh, right, because they were going to be next up after the slope, actually. They were going to be first, but then they needed time. Michael yeah. Ducey, do you know if... Um... Michael, yeah, he's on the call. Um, I believe we're ready. I need to confirm with Leo and Lorenzo, um, just based upon like the time consumption. Yeah, actually. So let's make an assumption that, that Falco is after Key Cloak. And Brandon, maybe you could just, or Michael, or whatever, reach out. Yeah, we could also technically do um, Falco first as well. Let me check with the Key Cloak folks, see whether they're ready, because the last time they said, um, let's wait till next month. Yeah. So, yeah, if they need a bit more time, then maybe we, we can go ahead with Falco then. Sounds good. Oh, so I had a question of um, um, NSM and streams. I I don't think I know what projects these are looking at. Uh, NSM is Network Service Mesh, and uh, oh, okay. So I've I've been in brief contact on Slack with Ed and uh, Frederick, 
uh, basically just answering some questions about the process and pointing them to the docs in the repo here uh, so they can get familiar with it. And I don't know if anyone from that team is on the call, but my general impression is that they're in the uh, getting familiar stage and you know, not really yet ready to engage. Okay. Yeah, I had conversations with Ed also about this and I think there's some eagerness there, which is good, but I definitely think they're not, they're not ready today. Yeah, maybe we can make a column in this for like notes where we can say like waiting on project or whatever, or in queue. Um, and so the, um, I'll just comment on Strims. That was, it came up at a TOC meeting where they gave a presentation. And um, at that time we were still, at least I was under the impression that we were getting guidance from the TOC to, um, do assessments for projects that had not, that when they were considering bringing them into the TOC mm -hmm. and um, into the, um, the as uh, CNCNF projects. And now we're getting, um, that was apparently not general TOC guidance, but the opinion of a single member. So that's where we're still like kind of figuring out that guidance. Um, but we do want one of our first five assessments to be a project that isn't specifically designed to deliver a security outcome. And this was kind of an interesting thing because it um, sort of, it, it allowed you to do, um, I can't remember exactly what it does, but it does something where it's like a pattern for how you deploy on Kubernetes um, for this particular um, type of software. So, um, so like I, I thought it might have some like sort of security convention that it's establishing for a uh, category of projects. Um, but that's an example. So we would be after we do the next two, like, so it would, OPA is the second, then we would do, we, we think Kiko, Koken, Kiko Fal Falco. Koken, Falco, and then we want a fifth that is a ideally a CNCF project that we think is you know worth our time in terms of it, you know of all the CNCF projects that don't aren't on our list of security projects mm -hmm. like what's one where it would be valuable to the community for us to assess the security of it so it's mark here hey i was going to propose prometheus if because there's a dependency here with logging so you know, if we had a breach in Prometheus, that's one of the high risk things because we depend on the logging to do a lot of the detection and, and forensics. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, Fluent uh, for the same reason. Uh, if, like, if, you're, if you're using it and lots of people are, it will be on all your hosts. So if there's a problem, uh, you're screwed everywhere. Prometheus is politically yeah. difficult. Um, oh, I, <laughs> I see. Yeah, yeah and also they they graduated, so right. It's, I'm not sure what the. Well, I think also uh, another way to say that, Justin, is that so Prometheus has already been through an audit, and we were going to deprioritize things that have been audited, and we actually looked at Prometheus as an example of, um, you know, when some of us read the audit, we had different opinions about the way it was handled. And so we were gonna go through the thought experiment potentially with the Prometheus team or some people from who were participating in that to talk about how we would handle it if different, if we had a different opinion, um, either from each other or from the project about the security assessment. And you know, how would we reason about that? How would we capture it in the report? Um, and so we have established amongst ourselves that it's okay for different security assessors, you know, security reviewers who are all volunteers to have a difference of opinion. And we would capture that and inform the TOC that we, you know, there were differences of opinions and this is what we came to. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, they could tell us what, how we want to resolve that or whatever. We are not arbiters of truth. We are, you know, sort of reporting to the TOC and to the community what our findings are as um, people who are knowledgeable in this area. And as we go through all these projects, having a visibility across a number of projects. 
So we, uh, we don't, because it's already been through that audit, we don't want to prioritize the assessment of it. Um, but we should prioritize that to queue up that discussion at some point. Um, so. Okay. Yeah, I think fluency is, a, is also a good suggestion. Maybe we can write it down and then we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I'm capturing it in the notes. Okay, and, and since we're on the topic, I'd like to kind of end the discussion about this specific topic with an urge for those who have been involved or are interested in looking at the assessment to sort of make one last pass over the OPA docs, which I'm posting here. Um, and let's uh, do what we can to get at least our side of this done. And I will push the uh, uh, Ash and others, or, or I guess politely ask Ash and others to please close this out so we can finalize it from their side as well. Great, I'm adding them to the notes. And I know that I, I have added comments and need to add more. Um, or at least give one full read through it since it has changed since the beginning. Um, it's wonderful. So we have um, in our remaining four more minutes, are there any announcements or um, things or burning questions or for the group? Yeah, I have one. So what's the, uh, what's our take about the cap one breach and encryption? <laughs> it's a very spicy thing to end the call with. <laughs> <laughs> In three minutes. Yeah. Anybody well, want to everyone's, everyone's making a big deal over once again, the way that somebody got in was bad permissions. Yeah, I'm not interested in that. I want to know why, you know, why, how do you have 30 gigs of unencrypted data that even an engineer that's an insider can get to? Yeah, what, I, then the question goes to like, how do you efficiently encrypt and decrypt on the fly 30 gigs worth of information? Yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, the thing is, this is uh, related to our work here. It's, you know, part of key management and uh, encryption and transit and at rest, you know, kind of these things that are in the controls framework that sometimes get left out. So it's a good use case. There, there, people seem to have some confusion about what encryption at rest means in a cloud context. Often people seem to think that encryption at rest is when something switched off, which an S3 bucket is never switched off. And it's always effectively online and so the kind of people's People have some confusion about the meaning of encryption at rest. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, we always took it to mean on the wire would be at, would be in motion, but that's well, that's not that's encryption in transit, not encryption at rest. Right, right. So the opposite is at rest. But, but historically, people have had applications, you know, where it'll be running on an encrypted disk volume, and when you shut your computer down, it's indeed encrypted. But while the application is running, everything's decrypted. And they still count that as encryption at rest, but that's not necessarily useful versus yes. actually having the data encrypted until immediately the point at which it's going to be used. Yeah, I mean, this is actually an interesting topic because it's sort of like cloud versus not cloud. Like if you have a desktop application, right, that needs to be encrypted at rest, you know, and you're keeping data in memory and you don't have any network interfaces, like it's a different world than you've got a cloud native application and things are. Well, it's tied, it's interesting. Yeah, we, we could talk about it sometime. Uh, it's a really secondary interest to the group, I suppose, but you know, you like to think about decryption is happening at the transaction level, not a 30 gig data set. Yeah, well, Yes. Unfortunately, uh, I'm going to have to drop off. I know others may have to yeah. leave. Soon. That's two o'clock. Yep. Great topic. Thanks, Maybe everybody. Tease apart some of it um, as a discussion for the future. Thanks for bringing it up, Mark. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>